everyone. Thank you so much for coming to this event tonight put on by the Wheeler Centre. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that we are on lands that were stolen from the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I pay my respects to elders past and present. Um, we're joined, joined in this beautiful venue, in this gathering, to speak with Robert Webb, who some of you may know from the enormously popular show Peep Show. Um, a big round of applause for people who know him from Peep Show. <laughs> As well as the British who stole those lands in the first place. <laughs> yes. We're going so to talk I'm about colonisation. <laughs> um, and others, I presume, also know Robert from his columns and from this book that we are here to discuss How Not to Be a Boy. So before we begin, Robert's just uh, going to very kindly grace us with a little reading. Shit. <laughs> uh, okay, which would you want the men from the Mars? Kenneth Gibbs. Oh, you want Kenneth Gibbs? Okay, good. good, good. Okay, good. Hello. Um, right, so uh, it's horrible when you go to book events and authors spend five minutes giving you the context of. Uh, well, you don't need to know much. I'm 12, and this is the end of my first year at uh, secondary school. Kenneth Gibbs was new. He wasn't a big lad, but he was Scottish with spiky hair. Either of these attributes alone would have been enough to alarm me, but the combination had me lowering my head whenever I heard his voice. It was like sitting in a classroom with a punk Gordon Strachan, but he was gregarious and friendly enough, and he slotted himself in quickly. The trouble with Gibbs was that he kept pinching girls on the arse. Mostly, they just told him to get lost, but Gibbs was enjoying being the cheeky chappy with a precocious eye for the ladies. He wouldn't stop. None of his targets wanted to be the first to make an issue of it, which was understandable. Who wants to mention their bottom to a teacher? One lunch break, after witnessing yet another unwanted goosing, Carl Billingham decided enough was enough. You remember Carl, the posh, freckly kid I sat next to. For God's sake, Gibbs, just pack it in. None of the girls wants you pinching them on the bum. Just grow up. At which point, Gibbs turned wordlessly to Carl and thumped him hard in the mouth. I'm glad to say that this kind of thing was rare enough to be shocking. Boys were forever hitting each other, but not in the face. Even Pete Garvey was shocked. Bloody hell, Gibbs, what'd you do that for? I'm going to report you, you little twat. Not, I'm going to kill you, mind. I'm going to report you. Boy, did I pick the right school. <laughs> It's afternoon registration, and Mrs. Broccoli has Ken Gibbs in a rhetorical half-Nelson and won't let go. She's calm, but occasionally remembers how livid she is. She doesn't raise her voice, it's just that her voice is never going to stop. She's teaching. She's quite simply going to teach this kid to death. From what I hear, Kenneth Gibbs, you've been behaving in this offensive and disrespectful manner for some... Stand up when I'm talking to you for some time, and that it isn't just Valerie and Fiona who've been subject to this appalling nuisance. Tiffany, is it true that you've been pinched as well? Tiffany Rampling, younger sister of the famous Tess Rampling, could have done without this, but nods. It's everyone, really. I mean, all the girls. All of the girls, Mrs. Broccoli repeats unnecessarily. She's already been told it's all the girls, but fact-finding is not her current purpose. <laughs> and she's only just getting started. Let's see then, hands up everyone who can honestly say that they've been pinched or otherwise groped by Kenneth over the last few weeks. Kenneth Gibbs, crimson of face, shifting his weight from foot to foot, watches wretchedly as every single female hand goes up. It happens in slow motion and the unanimity is crushing, but there's also a vulnerability about it which haunts me. Every girl checking every other girl for support. They need numbers. Mrs. Broccoli's sense of theatre doesn't desert her. She's quite determined that Kenneth Gibbs will never forget this. Look around you, Kenneth. Look at the classmates that you have insulted. She actually waits for him to do this. Gibbs does his best. Then she waits even longer. He tries looking around again at the silent tableau of his accusers. This really isn't his day. All right, girls, thank you. You can put your hands down. And now, Kenneth, look at Carl. Carl is sitting next to me with a wet paper towel over his mouth. His gums stopped bleeding about 20 minutes ago, and frankly, he's milking the situation slightly, <laughs> but I don't blame him. Mrs. Broccoli is reaching her conclusion. Carl didn't have to say anything. He could have stood idly by while you continued to harass your fellow pupils. But he chose not to. He chose to intervene, not because he expected to be thanked, but because it was right. Carl is a gentleman. 
She lets that last word hang in the air for a beat and then releases Gibbs from his stand-up misery. The subject is dropped and never raised again. Neither are the skirts of the girls of Form 1B, at least not by Kenneth Gibbs. This won't be the last time that the word gentleman bongs its way into my brain, making my heart race and my throat constrict. This time, it's a combination of shame and envy that's doing the bonging, throbbing and strangling. I was one of the boys who stood idly by, while Carl, no less of a physical weed than me, stepped up. Much as I would do almost anything to avoid even the minor biffing that Carl got for his trouble, it would almost be worth it, almost be worth it, if the result was to be called a gentleman. The word contains, but is not limited to, notions of chivalry and class. That is, one, boys should protect girls, and two, to be gentle is to aspire to gentility, the place where only posh people understand right from wrong. That's not what I heard from Mrs. Brockley. All she said was, boys should not disrespect girls because people should not disrespect people. They should aspire not to mere gentility, but to the greater prize, gentleness in their manners and in their actions. And anyone willing to do this, especially at the risk of a smack in the face, is worthy of praise. In fact, it sounded to me that to be a gentleman, you needed both manners and bravery. And that thought was horribly fascinating, because I thought only wimps needed manners, and only tough guys were brave. Thank you. Um, it's a perfect reading to actually set up uh, the rest of the book, and it comes obviously early, early on in the book, which sort of takes you from your childhood living in um, Woodhouse Spa to Cambridge and then to London. But really throughout the book, what really struck me was how you're looking always for a model of what kind of man to be, because you, you lacked adequate role models on that in your childhood, and yet you almost end up mirroring things that you didn't want to exhibit as you went through. And at one point you say, you sort of t reflect on that kind of um, statement that we often hear about masculinity being in crisis. And you say, I'm tempted to say that masculinity is a crisis. Yeah. Can you explain what you mean by that? Yeah, well, I, I then go on to say, I won't say that because it, <laughs> it, it, it sounds too neat. Um, I think that was just someone in love with a, a, a phrase there. Um, but, um, well, I, I, sometimes I think masculinity uh, is a crisis in that it's something that you recover from. Now, let me be clear. I'm not down on men. I think men can be magnificent. Men can be farty humans like all the other humans. Uh, and we can behave disgracefully and we, you know, and people are... People. I don't think being male is some innately fallen state, but I think masculinity, gender, the stuff that you put on top of sex difference, the stuff that gives sex meaning, is largely made up and, uh, and harmful uh, often to both boys and girls. And it starts in childhood, and that's why I approach the subject through a memoir, because that's where it all uh, kicks off. Um, but masculinity, I mean, in that passage, I was talking about, you know, what is it? Is it, you know, a love of leather wallets, uh, having medallions, <laughs> you know? It's difficult to talk about it without this, you know, importing this sort of steam tanker full of bullshit from the last century. And, you know, I look at the, you know, the poem uh, If by Roger Kipling, where he talks about, you know, uh, is a, is a, a famous uh, version of masculinity. I'm very fond of the poem. Uh, and he's talking about grace under pressure and stoicism and, uh, and physical courage. And, and that's all fine. It's just that I can't help noticing that I've seen women exhibit these qualities all my life. Uh, and indeed, if you've, if you've been in the same room as a woman giving birth, then you're very quickly cured of the idea that grace under pressure or physical <laughs> courage are exclusively male virtues. Um, Kipling would disagree, but then so would a lot of people in 1909. Um, <laughs> So, uh, in terms of role models, I mean, my dad, uh, he, uh, my mum divorced him when I was five, and uh, up until then, he was uh, quite a scary figure to me. Uh, he punished his sons physically. He didn't really quite know what to do with a small family. He drank a fair bit, but then so did, so did all of his friends. This is 1970s rural England we're talking about, and he wasn't doing anything. Uh, unusual to contextualize it, you know, uh, you could still uh, have corporal punishment in primary schools. You could still come at a nine year old with a stick uh, and be a teacher 
and um, that was all fine. Uh, so, so there's that. Um, but yes, you're right. Most of the people who I looked up to when I was a boy were women. Uh, I had one grandfather that I was fond of, um, but generally, in terms of role models, uh, they were mainly uh, people on TV. Mm. There was uh, Buck Rogers and Hannibal... Uh, uh, I nearly said Hannibal Lecter, but that wouldn't... <laughs> Jesus, that would be uh, Hannibal Lecter, formative influence. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and um, uh, Hannibal Smith and, uh, and Michael Knight and Steve Austin and Colt Seavers and uh, John and Ponch and Starsky and Hutch and uh, Stringfellow Hawk and uh, all those guys. And Zora, and not a father amongst them. And, and very few problems in life that you can't solve by punching someone quite hard in the face. Uh, so those, those were my role models. They were, I wouldn't be without them. It's... It's interesting because the book does start with, um, obviously, you're positioned in your memories as a young child, and, and as the reader, you feel that fear that you have of your father. And later, there's a moment later on where you're reflecting on um, Annabeth, your younger sister, who is 14 years younger than you, I 15, think. 15, yeah. 15 years younger than you. And uh, it's after your mother passes away, and, um, you know, your sort of lovely but hapless stepfather, Derek, yeah. doesn't really... It's kind of another rural man in the middle of England who's left to take care of a three-year-old and doesn't really know how to do that. But, but as you sort of read the book, it, it feels like he's trying his best. Yeah. But Annabeth is kind of without, at three years old, without any sort of uh, boundaries. And there's this moment where she's standing up on a chair and you take her off the chair and she throws a tea towel at you and you yell at her, we don't, you don't throw things. Mm -hmm. And it as the reader, you see that there's that fear in you that you're kind of exhibiting some of your father because Annabeth runs into the bedroom, the parents' bedroom, and just uh, kneels down on the floor by the mother's side of the bed, yeah. who, the mother who's passed away at this point. Not there. Yeah, you run to your mummy to yeah. protect you from the scary guy. And suddenly, and it I, takes you, suddenly I was yeah. the scary guy and there was no mummy to run to. I mean, it's the, easily the saddest thing in the entire book <laughs> that you've gone in, gone in at quite a steep angle there. But. Well, <laughs> well, actually, what I, what I was... Uh, I, I didn't mean, I didn't mean okay, to get no, into no, that cool, so, cool. so early on. But what I wanted to say was that it's, it's really masterfully done how you start with the image of the scary father. Yeah. And by the end of the book, he's become... A, a lot more human in lots of ways and, and certainly your relationship with him has healed and I found that interesting that it is very obvious from the start that you have a lot of women who you know you look up to and who you feel safe with but actually as you progress on your journey towards manhood the men in your life become more relatable and more um, softer as well in your recollection of them yeah I think I think that uh, that journey in the book traces pretty much what happened in in my life and that as I got older I realized that I uh, I did want uh, dad's approval more than I thought because you know I spent a lot of my teenage years uh, thinking that I didn't need him, and I defined myself almost as uh, the opposite of him. He was a rural, conservative uh, person of a certain age with certain views, and not all conservatives are horrible, and he wasn't horrible. In fact, my, my granddad, who I loved, uh, was also a conservative, but, um, but, but Dad, you know, he had certain views about uh, women and people of colour and gay people, and he wouldn't use any of these terms. Uh, and um, and we, you know, and when I went back to live with him, um, when my mum died when I was seventeen, you know, he would uh, he was a great cook, and he would cook his tea, and we would watch Channel Four News at seven o'clock, and he would just shout at, at whatever person was failing to maintain the, the status quo, and I would just and he'd ask me what for my opinion. He wanted a frank exchange of views, and I just I wasn't interested in doing that because he, you know, he, he worked as a, uh, my daddy was a woodcutter, he'd, wor he'd worked in the, the local estates cutting down trees and he was, it left him half deaf. So there was, no, there was no way of launching into a sentence without knowing where you needed to get to. Um, I, well, I think actually Neil Kinnock, what? I, th I think uh, may maybe there's a, there's, a, there's a way of saying that, what boy, what? I, I, I think I po possibly, um, but there's a room for nuance here in it, what? And, you know, forget it. So, um, but as I got older, I mean, the book starts with me. I did this uh, charity dance thing for Comic Relief uh, dressed in a leotard. And, uh, and uh, it's one of the sort of moments that I recount that I got a message from him, a voicemail from him, 
where he said how proud of me he was. And it made, uh, I had no idea how much I needed to hear that from him. Uh, so, you know, I, we both got a little bit older and we both sort of, uh, what really helped was not having to live with him anymore. <laughs> Usually tends to help. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, it's, yeah, it's funny because he, you know, bringing it back to the theme of masculinity and the way I suppose, I mean, the way I read him is, as you said, like a, a traditional kind of rural man who really wasn't very different to a lot of people around him. So not, no. not extra specially cruel and sadistic, just a sort of an no. averagely... Oh, I don't think he was a sadist at all. I think he just didn't really know what to do yeah. with a young family. And he kind of, you know, he, he had no reason to think outside of the box. He didn't know he was in a box. He, I mean, he, it was kind of, you do, this is what you do. You work hard, you have a drink, you come home and you're very bad-tempered with your family. And then you, and then you do that again and again and again until someone divorces you. That's, that was kind of... And then you... And then you get cancer and then you die. I mean, that, that was kind of, that's what you do, isn't it? And um, there, was no, there was no need to question any of that. Um, so, uh, yeah, but, um, but the, the things about him that I did admire was that he, which I only came to quite late on, was that I realised that everyone in the village thought he was just straightforwardly kind, that he would, he, he was easily bored and he had several self-employed businesses and he was a coal merchant and, a, and he delivered logs and stakes to people and he fixed up people's gardens. And he would often do all this stuff uh, without charging people because cause he, cause he did and everyone thought he was fucking great. And, but, you know, again, they didn't have to live with him. But, but he was also... Uh, very charming, very funny, and I say in the book, you know, he didn't so much live in that village as host it, and you'd, <laughs> you'd be in the pub and he'd walk in and you'd just sense the whole room subtly adjust itself in his direction and settle itself in for a treat, and he was a lot of fun. You write a lot about kindness in the book and, and almost this sort of pursuit of learning how to be a kind person, because there's a big chunk in the middle where you're I not, think, not very I think, kind, yeah, yeah. I think it's fair to say that you would even say that you're a... A shit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, and sort of recognising as well that you spent so long with this idea of what kind of man you didn't want to be, mm. but the kind of man that you were becoming was one that didn't recognise kindness as being an important trait. That's right, yeah. I think by the time I got to university, and remember, Mum had died when I was 17, and I retook my A-levels, and it took me a year and a half, and I sat in the classes of the, the kid, the, the children, the winkies, the small children the, of the year below, uh, which was just an a unbelievable humiliation. But I, I, you know, I coped by trying to get the jokes in first. Um, and so it was only a couple of years later I found myself at university, and I was still... Uh, really in a bad place from that and hadn't really dealt with that grief, hadn't really recognised it. Just as a sidebar, um, it's worth saying, I went, sidebar, it's worth saying, I want to do it again, uh, it's worth, maybe later, it's worth saying that, you know, one of the things I say about masculinity in childhood or gendered, uh, gender con con conditioning in boys is the stuff about when you're experiencing a negative emotion, an unwanted emotion, grief or pain or fear or anxiety, and you are often told to not express it. You know, um, boys don't cry, shrug it off, button it up, man up, all that stuff. And it comes out somewhere, and it usually comes out as anger. And I think it leaves you unprepared for adversity. So when mum died, I didn't talk to anybody, even though there were lots of people saying, if you need to talk, then talk. And I was kind of, what's this talking? I don't understand. Well, how's talking going to change anything? It doesn't, of course, it doesn't change anything apart from your own ability to cope with what's, what's happened. Um, so, uh, so that was still going on when I arrived um, at university. And I sort of, I think there was, a, there was an element of me sort of taking it out on everyone and also, but also the good old fashioned pretentious student stuff, which, you know, there's a lot to be said for. You know, you turn up and there's, it's a, very whole, intoxicating. there's a whole new bunch of people and you, it's, it's, it's time for complete self-reinvention and you can tell a whole bunch of lies. You can pretend that you're French. Uh, you can do also. There was a kid whose name was Luke who spelt his name L-U-C instead of L-U-K-E just for shits and giggles, just to pretend that he was French. And 
why not? And I, you know, if you're going to do that kind of thing, there's no better time. Um, but yeah, no, I thought kindness was way down the list of uh, important things to be. I thought it was important to be ambiguous, uh, sophisticated, um, witty, sexy, uh, very, you know, uh, like 10 things before kind. And of course, kind is number one. Be being kind is, it's the, it's the silver bullet. It's the answer to everything. <laughs> but it was like number 16, 17 on my list of priorities. Um, I, I read this little bit out to Robert downstairs and said I didn't think that there would be an appropriate place to read it out, but I actually feel like I can slot it in right here. Okay. Um, talking about kindness and being at university and being insufferable, uh, during the middle of the book, when you're sort of from ages 15 to 17, Robert, the 15 to 17 year old, is particularly obsessed with the idea, with the fact that he's not having any sex at all. And then he ends up at university and starts having a lot of sex and writes in his diary, God, this thing is starting to read like confessions of a sex maniac. <laughs> it's awful, I know, but I'm just recounting the facts. <laughs> and this is after, this is after page after page after page, years. Okay. Okay, so I think Jo fancies me. Actually, she doesn't fancy me. She said, let's just be friends. Okay, I think Jenny, I, I stood next to her at the party and I said, should we go out with each other? And she said, let it be a shame not to spoil our friendship. Let's just be friends. <laughs> and, so, and I'm going out with her and suddenly she, she let me kiss her and I touched her on the boob and she said, let's be friends. And it goes on and on and on. And I thought the diary would be this invaluable resource and actually it's so fucking boring because it's just this again and again and again. What is wrong with these girls? Why do they lack the basic imagination to find me attractive. What is the problem? What's wrong with my thin white leather tie that I insist on wearing to parties? What's, what's wrong with my red and grey ski jacket that's a bit like in AHA, not very, but a bit? And, you know, what is their problem? These daughters of farmers and accountants, they're so stupid. <laughs> So, yeah, and then eventually, and then I go to university and, and, you go and, and it, 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 things cheered up, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, um, that was, a, that was a, the world's first humble brag. Oh, yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm just telling you the just truth. Reca it's, it's awful, I know. Yeah, I know. Stop me. <laughs> oh, honestly. But it's interesting, it was really interesting to read that in the context of you know, the discussion that... We're going to go to a slightly dark place again. <laughs> Sorry. Um, it's just... That's a lovely... <laughs> turn on a sixpence. In the, well, in the no, context in the, of people <laughs> driving vans down pavements. In the context of, of, yeah. of incels and, you know, young men who are not adequate... Who are not taking are not the opportunities yeah. that are presented to them to figure out how to deal with their own anger and their entitlement. And, yeah. you know, there was a, um, a newspaper headline today that said uh, it was, I'm going to remember it, so I might be butchering it a little bit, but um, spurned, it was something about the guy who, who just shut up a school in Texas, that he was spurned by a girl and that's what provoked his attack. Yeah. Um, so basically it's the girl's fault. So basically it's the girl's fault. Yeah. And I thought that was really interesting because I, uh, uh, the way that you wrote about these women that were rejecting you is a way that everyone feels, but obviously the difference yeah. is that even though you didn't write necessarily very nice things about them in your diary... No, I didn't. Um, ..and you sometimes wrote them not very nice letters explaining what okay, was wrong uh, with them. OK, that only happened once. Um, <laughs> you wrote two uh, letters. OK, two letters, yeah, all right. <laughs> um, But it was, I, I thought it was a really powerful insight into the way that kind of mindset operates. When yeah. you're a, a teenager, you're, you're sort of, you're dealing with hormones and rejection anyway, but you're also, you know, being positioned as a, as a white man, you're also dealing with the rejection of what it is you have been socialised to think is your yeah. right. Yeah. Um, well, now, oh, well, that's one of the differences between me and the likes of uh, Elliot Rogers mm. and, and uh, the, the guys who shoot up schools. The, obvious, the first obvious difference being no access to firearms. But uh, I would like to think that even if, even if I had, um, I don't sufficiently have a soul of pitch uh, that I would do that. And secondly, it didn't feel like an, it didn't feel like an entitlement that had gone wrong. No. It felt like a pressure... Uh, it felt like my failure 
to do something that was that was obvious. And it, and it was, you know, my friends, uh, it wasn't like I was the last person to lose my virginity, but like there were th two or three key people who'd done it before me, and I thought, this is, and then I looked at my other friends who were also virgin, and I didn't want to be in that gang, I wanted to be in this <laughs> gang. Quite apart from I thought it would be nice. Uh, but I mean, looking back, and, it, and it's kind of incredible, because, uh, you know, seven, I don't think 17 is, is particularly, uh, it seems quite young now to me, to, to lose your virginity. I mean, God knows my, I have two daughters who are six and eight, and they're not going to want to fucking hear this by the time they're teenagers, and I'm sure they won't pay any attention, and that is their prerogative. But I think 17 is quite young. I think, you know, sex is this very powerful and uh, beautiful and sometimes ridiculous and sometimes funny, uh, but complicated and huge thing, and I, I think 17 is... I think 17 is too young now. But anyway, uh, I'm now being an old fart. Uh, uh, but, it, but yes, it, it didn't feel like I was entitled to something that wasn't being given to me. It felt like it, it was largely self-loathing. But of course, you know, there's that going on with, the, with these guys as well. A lot of self-loathing and a lot of insecurity and a, and a, and a, and a, and a dearth of self-respect. Um, but, uh, but these, and of course, the other difference was no internet. And no, no Reddit, no 4chan, no 8chan, no uh, people uh, of a certain university in a certain city in Canada, for example, uh, writing books about how... I mean, let's not be coy. So Jordan fucking Peterson. <laughs> um, you know, I read the introduction to his book. And, you know, I'm get, he keeps coming up, so I thought, oh, I'm going to have to read this fucking book. So I, I read the introduction, and it turns out what, what's happened is... He, when he wrote his first book, spent 15 years, and he has studied, uh, and he has studied all of world culture to his satisfaction. <laughs> and his, his summary of it <laughs> is that um, men represent order and women represent chaos. In all of these stories and myths and legends and religions, in all of world culture, which he has studied and understood to his satisfaction, <laughs> that is what's going on. But before he moves on, he moves straight on to say, and because it happens in stories, it must be true. And therefore, patriarchy is correct. We were right the first time. Men are in charge because they're better at it. Um, but he didn't pause in the way that Aesop paused in the 4th century BC to ask... <laughs> The question, who painted the lion? Do you remember the, 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 so there's do you, this? Do you this, remember? This, do you remember the, well, <laughs> well, I'm not saying you were there. Um, I, however, am a time lord, <laughs> as are all British men. <laughs> um, but uh, no, the fable, you know the, the fable with Aesop, so there's a man and a lion looking at a painting of a man and a lion. And in the painting, the man is killing the lion. And they're looking at that, and the man turns to the lion and says to the lion, you see, this shows that men are stronger than lions. And the lion replies, mm, who painted the lion? And this is made famous again in, in Chaucer, in the Canterbury Tales, where it's given a sort of proto-feminist spin in the prologue of The Wife of Bath's Tale, where her husband, Yankin, is reading her uh, of an evening, as he likes to, a story, tales of wicked wives, a sort of, sort of early Breibart news, uh, sort of <laughs> uh, anti-feminist tract, and she, she quotes the Who Painted the Lion, and he, Peterson doesn't seem to have noticed that, you know, all this stuff about, you know, men are terrific, men are terrific, and men represent order, and women represent care. Well, who fucking came up with all this stuff? <laughs> and it's like, you know, sometimes people say he's a throwback to the 1950s. No, this party's been going for two and a half thousand years, <laughs> and he hasn't noticed. But it's frightening how many, you know, he's, he's extremely popular. Yeah, it's... with very, very angry young men. And, and, I th and, and, he, and I read an interview in the New York Times where he said he literally, I mean, fucking, I mean, he would deny it. I mean, he could be sitting here and I'd say, Jordan Peterson, you, you seem to be a man with two arms and two legs. And he asked me to start defining my terms. Um, <laughs> he's a slippery academic and they're 10 to a dozen. Mm -hmm. but, he, but yes, he's very popular. But he, there was an interview where... They were talking about um, uh, talking about the, the the incident, the horrible uh, murder in Toronto, which was another incel guy, I think. I mm, think that's yeah, right. Yeah. And um, and he said, yes, I think uh, society would be better off if uh, the sexual favours of women were redistributed more evenly. 
And what happens when they're not is that uh, frustrated men um, take it out on everybody else. And, and he was talking about enforced monogamy. I mean, this is repulsive. I mean, if he wasn't such a fucking joke... I think Bart Simpson has a Jordan Peterson duvet cover. I mean, the, gu <laughs> the guy's... He's a joke, but he's also, you know, talking, saying this stuff, yeah. and, it's, and it's being taken seriously uh, to, with lethal uh, yeah. results. And that's the frightening thing about it, is that he is a joke, and it's ridiculous what he's saying. And I, and I feel like all of that stuff is very easy for people who are willing to think critically about it to dismantle it easily. And yet... If you say to a group of people what they want to hear and you put an academic spin yeah. on it, then it becomes really attractive to them. I think what, what's happening is that they, you know, there, there is a certain section of, of that society, and indeed it, it happens, it's there in Britain as well, where this unbelievably glacially slow removal of privilege, of, of male privilege, or the, the slowdown in this affirmative action scheme for men that we've had for several hundred years, this positive discrimination scheme, of which I've been a beneficiary, by the way, in my own, in my own day job as, uh, in TV comedy, um, is being... Uh, you, you've got people telling young men to experience this as persecution, mm. instead of just this... What it really is, is a gradual withdrawal of, of uh, uh, positive discrimination. Mm. It's, it's like that um, internet saying, you know, to people with privilege, equality feels like oppression. Yeah. Um, and I, th uh, I want to go back to the book and the way that, you know, one of the things I thought was so beautiful in it was that you really celebrate aspects of boyhood and masculinity that are not necessarily... Um, like you, you point out in the book, obviously, that you're not against masculinity. It's just that you're against the more toxic elements of it. But, you know, as a little boy, you played with your imaginary band of... The guy buys. The, the guy buys. Yeah. The Who guy... were like your 12 apostles. Yeah, the guy buys were my imaginary gang of friends. Uh, 12, yes, 12. <laughs> uh, and I was the captain of the guy buys. And, um, yeah, we rode around on our bikes. Um, my, mine was a real bike that they had invisible bikes. <laughs> Although my, my bike was actually a motorbike, um, but it was really, it was a bike. Um, and we would fight crime. <laughs> yeah, so there was the guy buys. There's also, you know, the fact that you went to Cambridge to study theatre and to write comedy sketches. Um, there's a, a writer called C.J. Pascoe who did a book about... She went to, and stayed in a high school for four months and did an anthropo anthropological study of these high school students. And she talked about the boys as having this, code, this system of compulsive heterosexuality where they had to enforce each other's heterosexuality yeah, and Sounds I think pretty that... gay. <laughs> In four, I'm going to enforce your heterosexuality, young man. I'll be seeing just how heterosexual you were. <laughs> I'll be looking at the pictures. <laughs> oh, yeah. But you write, you write about that as well. You know, when you, before you go to your high school, you write about the, you know, the sort of absurd kind of... Um, I mean, we would all be familiar with what that code of a compulsive heterosexuality is. And you write about how, you know, playing with your groups of... of like, as little boys, playing with your groups of friends, who all had to be boys, because if there was a girl there, then it immediately made it gay. Yeah. Um, or if you were a boy that liked spending time with girls, you were immediately gay. Yeah, it makes you was, gay, yeah. And that was wrong. Hanging out with girls is completely gay. <laughs> <laughs> but then you obviously developed attraction for men and women. Yeah, which and, is even gayer. Which is even gayer. <laughs> yeah. And you don't... You write a little bit about kind of navigating that, um, which you, you sort of seem to do with... You, you touch a little bit on feeling shame about it because yeah. I guess it's the location that you're growing up in and the time. Yeah. But you don't really explore that too much. Did you find it an easy process or...? No, so this was Will, um, well, the person who I call Will in the book, and I emailed him uh, when I was doing the first draft and I said, look, I'm doing this memoir, I'm, I'm going to have to do you and me, is that all right? And he replied going... Uh, why do you have to be famous? <laughs> oh, all right then. Nothing too graphic. Uh, and I think you'll agree, it's all very chaste. Uh, yeah. me and it's very Will. innocent. Uh, it's, it's beautiful. Very, it's, it's, uh, yeah. Well, he was my first love, basically. So I was about 16 and I, uh, I completely... I was just nuts about him. 
and it wasn't quite platonic, but there again, we weren't quite, uh, it wasn't really a relationship. We weren't quite secret boyfriends, but something was going on. I mean, in the book, I say, uh, Will patrols his heterosexuality like a prison guard who's lost faith in the penal system. <laughs> um, and it was, you know, it was, it was kind of like that, but I, I adored him, and he kind of, he slightly, strung me along, but there again, he wasn't averse to the odd, how'd you do, but there again, he, he had a girlfriend and she didn't know and blah, blah. It was all really bitter. Uh, but, um, but no, he was great. And how did I navigate it? I just kept it a secret. Although, you know, mo most of our friends, and indeed it turned out later, we didn't know this at the time, most of the teachers at that school just thought we were going out. Um, we just sort of, we were clearly just <laughs> prancing around the place. Uh, talking, but we, you know, we just had lots of shared interests and we both loved Fry and Laurie and In Excess and Prince and, uh, you know, all the, we loved all the same things and we did impressions of teachers and we would have a pound of pint games of pool and, you know, we just hung out mainly. We were just best mates, but also with some wanking. <laughs> Um, <laughs> best kind of friendship, given, really. Also, you know, given how lyrically I describe it in the book, I really, I really think I've sold it short now. <laughs> oh, well. Um, but just, just bringing it back to your dad for a minute, there's a really beautiful scene where you, you're, you tell your dad that, or you sort of indicate to him that you that your past lovers haven't all been women. Yeah. And, you know, this is someone who kind of, as you point out, he sort of manages to say often the absolute right thing and the absolute wrong thing all at the same time, like mm -hmm. using traditionally homophobic language to talk about how it's not, you know, th that they shouldn't be persecuted because it's not their fault. Yeah. Um, and so you sort of say to him, you, you mentioned to him that you, your past lovers have been both men and women. And the way he responds is really weirdly supportive, but also, I mean, it's supportive, but also weirdly um, enforcing of like really rigid masculinity because he kind of slaps you on the back and says, oh, it's just because you just want to get your balls deep into anything. Yeah, it? yeah. Oh, no, basically, my son. It's, it's fine because as long as it's about sex, because in a way, the, 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 the idea that I'm his son, and therefore I'm a web, and therefore web males, what they do is they want sex all the time. <laughs> so the fact that I'm not fussy about who I, what the sex of the person I have sex with makes complete sense to him. Uh, so it's fine. And it kind, of, it kind of it came up because he just asked me straight out. Because as you say, we were watching, a, watching the news, and there was some report about homophobic bullying. And, uh, and, you know, teenage boys, you know, being suicidal because they're being bullied for being gay. And Dad actually got quite angry. And he said, it's not their fault, they're shirtlifters, bless them. <laughs> and, uh, and then he said, I've always said that if you, or Mark, or, so I have these two older brothers, Mark and Andrew. And he said, I've always said that if you, or Mark or Andrew, felt that way inclined, then you, or Mark, or Andrew, <laughs> if you wanted to tell me that you, or Mark, or Andrew, <laughs> were queer, then I'd be fine with that. I mean, there, there are blokes who throw you out on the street, but they're dicks. I wouldn't. I went, okay, th thanks, thanks. And, and then he kind of went, so what's the score, boy? <laughs> and then I said, not, not all the people I've been with were, uh, were girls. And he went, I knew it! He went, you like a bit of both. Uh, you just like, yeah, it was, I think the phrase is, you, you just look, God, you just like putting it in holes. Or, it was something, or something like that, like yeah. That. But this is the uh, same person who at 13 sort of joked to you that you were probably drunk and, f I'm quoting, feeling up girls' titties all over the village. Yeah, he was very, he was very upset. <laughs> One of the few times that I saw him during that sort of, between when I was five and uh, 19 when I moved back in with him at 18, uh, birthdays and Christmases, he, he would sort of pay a, a, a drunken visit to the, to the bungalow. Uh, but one other time, he took me on to this fireworks display. Uh, one of his friends, one of his more wealthy friends, had set up this marvellous fireworks display. And then it was just this house party where I didn't really know anybody. And I was, yeah, what was I, about 30? I've said that I'm 30, 12-ish. 
in the book. And I didn't want a shandy or a lager or a beer. I was happy with my Coke. And he's like, are you sure you won't have a beer? I don't want a beer. And then he just started talking about how I know you, Webby. Left to your own devices, you'd be going around snogging every girl at this party and feeling their titties. I know you. And I was kind of, yeah. Well, <laughs> that's, that's me. You've got me. You've got me in a nutshell there. I'm prepubescent. I wanted to finish by just reflecting on the way that, you know, as I said, you sort of start with these kind of like quite ominous figures of masculinity in your life, but then by the end, the book really beautifully kind of rounds out to you understanding them a lot more, to you kind of having a lot of awareness as well about the, the lessons that la they lacked as men and the opportunities that they may have lacked to have broken out of some of those masculine, the, the, you know, the kind of, kind of very rigid forms of masculinity. And you reflect on the end about um, the death of your last grandparent, John, yeah. and he says to you as you're sort of walking out, at least we had good holidays. And I just wanted to read this last little bit and he said, at least we had some good holidays, mate. I turn back and reassure him that we had some brilliant holidays, which we did. But what does he mean, at least? I think I know. He felt a de deficit, and so did Derek, and so did Dad. None of them spent their last words with me saying, I wish I'd spent less time with my children. I wish I'd dominated more men. I wish I'd cried less. I wish I'd shrugged and walked away more often when I upset the women I loved. I wish I'd spent less time saying what I was really afraid of and what I really wanted. No, they ended their lives saying that they missed out on too much of the good stuff, friendship, understanding, family and love, and that they'd caused too much harm. That's where I was heading until a few years ago, and there are boys whose bicycles still have stabilisers on that that are heading in that direction right now. I would save them the trouble. Yeah. Why, why are we still at this point where these very obvious lessons are still needing to be learned for men? It's such a tragedy. I, I, I don't know. I really don't know. And, I, don't, and I, you know, I, I wrote the book with the best of intentions, and I, but I don't, I don't honestly, I don't, I'm not, uh, I'm not particularly optimistic about, about it, it mm. doing anything. I mean, I've read books that, you know, I've thought, this has changed my life. I think this is amazing. I'm going to be a completely, completely, oh, the kettle's boiled. Oh, I was, <laughs> I mean, uh, oh is that on? Is that on again? I had no idea that was on again. You know, so you know, you you write a book, you put it out there, and you, you you try and make a contribution. And you know, I've got to a stage where I will never, ever, ever be bored with trying to entertain people, make them laugh. Although you'll notice, I've given myself a night off tonight. But um, <laughs> but but I, I, because I think you can say serious things through humour. But uh, but also there is this the feeling that you know I am in this colossally lucky position and. Uh, I really ought to try and make myself useful. And I think uh, you, to, the, the way we talk to boys, the way we tell them you, that you can't cry and that you are the default human and that you are the, the, the way you relate to girls is, is uh, the way they relate to girls is, is just so weird and it's still going on. And, and uh, so anyway, I've, I, I wrote something uh, and... That's how I feel about it. Mm. <laughs> um, yeah, round of applause. Hi, Robert. Hey there. My name's Max. Hi. Um, I just want to say thanks for writing the book. I was really grateful that you wrote it, and I'm grateful that I had the opportunity to read it. Thank you for reading it. Thank you. Um, I'm 29. My, my mom recommended it to me, actually. That's why I read it. Um, my question is, why do you think it took you so long to realize like what feminism had to offer and why you should be a feminist? And how can we make sure that more young men and boys get to realize that earlier themselves? Thank you. What, <laughs> what were you waiting for? <laughs> um, uh, no, it's a perfectly good question. Um, I, I was, believe it or not, some men don't get there at all. It's, it's not a loved word. Uh, it, I don't use the word feminist in the book very often because I want people to read it. Um, and it's, it's become this very divisive term because a lot of people, including a lot of women, uh, think that it's, it's to do with hating men. It's, of course, nothing to do with that. It's about you know, challenging a system of thought and a series of economic and practices that, that, that oppress one half of the population and which 
make the other half of the population unhappy, to put it very, very glibly. Um, so uh, how did, why did it take me that long? I mean, I, did, I, I would have challenged that idea in my 20s and early 30s. I would have said, no, of course I'm a feminist, of course I am. Uh, because I vote Labour, uh, because I've read Man Made Language by Dale Spender, because I've written uh, anti feminist, uh, sorry, anti or anti, <laughs> anti said, that's my other career, uh, anti sexist comedy sketches. So, no, this is never going to happen to me. And then, of course, you become a dad and you get married, and, and suddenly the whole, that whole stuff is just waiting for you. That model of what you saw when you were a kid yourself in a gendered a uh, traditionally gendered uh, family is ready to be reenacted if you don't really keep an eye on it. Of course, I don't hit the kids. I'd rather chew my own arms off. But I was drinking a bit more, and I, was, I did have this breadwinning panic, and I was taking jobs that I didn't need to do. And I was just trying to get out of the house. And, everybody, and every time I put a wash on, I thought I deserved a medal. And just all of this stuff that you've seen in your childhood, uh, and you think you're the world's most, you know, woke guy. No, you're not a... Uh, I'm not interested in hearing from male feminists who don't know where the mop is. I, so, I sort of say in the... <laughs> and I don't say that to ingratiate myself with women, but uh, <laughs> that is a byproduct. Uh, so how do we get more young men How do we get... In? Oh, I don't fucking know. Just read the book. I mean... Uh, <laughs> There should probably be, I mean, um, at my school in the 80s, there was this useless waste of time called general studies, which was a, you know, you could do a, a half an A-level in it. It was, you know, there is, there's always room in the curriculum. Why don't you put something useful in it, like uh, how to, how to... Okay, well, okay, well, respectful relationships, there's your answer. <laughs> Question up there? Yeah, I took out half of the role to get here. <laughs> now I'm dreading my question. Um, I read your book last year in England. I got it really cheap from Asda. It was amazing. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> fuck, fuck it, I've already been paid. I don't care how you got it. <laughs> <laughs> but I wanted to... I've got a little boy who's four, and I really liked the part towards the end of the book where you talk about speaking with your daughters about the trick um, mm. when they talk about... Um, the differences in gender roles and feminism. And I just want to, we haven't talked about that much tonight. I wanted you to tell us a little bit more about that. Oh, thank you, okay. Well, the trick uh, briefly was, uh, so uh, my, our youngest daughter, uh, sorry, our oldest daughter, uh, Esme, was about five and she was having a conversation with her mum and uh, there was a non-uniform day coming up at school. And she said to her mother, um, if I go as Spider-Man and not as a princess, uh, do you think people will laugh at me? And Abby said, people might laugh, and what will you say if they do? And Ezzy replied, shall I tell them that they're laughing because of the trick that makes girls get rubbish jobs and boys sad? <laughs> um, and Abby said, yes, I think that would be a very good answer. So, so the, trick, the trick came from uh, a time they were looking at pictures of handbags or something, and Abby mentioned the patriarchy. It's that kind of family. And... Um, <laughs> And this came back as patriarchy, and then it turned into the trick. And it's now basically the family code word for uh, all the gender nonsense that not only Ezzy and Dory, but their female and male friends at primary school will spend their lives wading through. This is how you are a girl. You are not, you know, you can dream of being an astronaut or a rocket scientist, but let's be serious. And boys, you know, you want to be a florist, but come on. Uh, all of that stuff, and uh, you know, and I think to to give them a word for it, and to be able for them to be able to name it when they see it, is to be forewarned and forearmed. And I think it's a it's a fairly straightforward uh, duty of care to to give them that language. Well, first of all, thank you for coming and. If you could ask David to come to Australia as well, that'd be lovely. Um, <laughs> That's oh, his question. Boy. He's just... I'll thank take, you. I'll take that as a comment. <laughs> um, 
You mentioned uh, Jordan Peterson earlier, and not that I want to invoke the president who must not be named, but when you were talking about, you know, do we discuss him as a joke or do we discuss him as a serious problem? Yeah. And I'd be curious to hear from both of you um, onto the subject. Is actually treating these kind of, you know, prominent misogynists as a kind of a joke, a perpetual part of the problem? Or how do we deal with that kind of thing in future? I don't know. If, you, if, you, if we're talking about someone who's talking seriously about enforced monogamy, it feels like, you know, I don't feel a, a huge responsibility to engage with that person in any serious way. And it, and it feels like, you know, that is your own Clive James who talked about the pendulum, you know, the people on the left, people on the right, people who are interested in the good of the people, people who are interested in the public good. And there are serious people on both sides, the pendulum was swinging between them. He was talking about elections, but here's the parameters of decent, civilized debate uh, between, you know, it didn't have to be gentle, didn't have to be good-tempered, but that, those were the parameters. It now feels like the parameters are here, and here are some fascists knocking together, and I don't have to talk to those fuckers. <laughs> I think it depends on how much genuine power they wield. Now, I guess Jordan Peterson is wielding a fair amount of power at the moment in terms of influencing particularly the minds of a certain kind of young man. Um, when Milo Yiannopoulos came to Australia at the end of last year, I was repeatedly asked by numerous different media outlets to answer to his request to debate me. Um, <laughs> Why won't you debate Milo? And I not only was asked oh. by them, but was you know received lots of emails from 15-year-old boys asking me exactly the same thing. Um, and it felt that's a perfect way to describe it because it felt like there was no answer that I could give. That I mean, the answer was of course no because I'm not going to waste my time. Yeah. And there's no, it's not actually a fair and even playing ground because that's not the purpose of what they want to happen. Um, but it sometimes feels a little bit like. You've got siblings, so you'll know this. When you're a kid and you do that game with your siblings where you're like, I'm not touching you, I'm not touching you. <laughs> I'm not touching Mom, make him stop. I'm not, but I'm not touching him, I'm not touching him. And that's sort of how it feels yeah. to engage with these people, you know, that you've just got someone or like a million fingers flying around your fucking head not touching you. And when you try and say, stop doing this, oh, triggered, ooh, tri snowflake. Yeah, yeah. So it, it feels really, really unfair. And I think that the scary thing about it and the dangerous part about it is that you are dealing with people who essentially act like children. But children who've been given rifles and bombs and the ability to really sincerely damage people's lives. Like it's and, beca and because every, anyone can publish anything yeah. now, which is, the, which is the, the, the big difference between when I was now and when I was a kid. Mm. That you know, it's an, and in some ways, of course, it is democratizing and it is good. And I, I you know, I'm not a. It's Peterson. Interestingly, is this kind of. I, I think young people should take the fucking hands out of their pockets and take that gum out of their mouth. <laughs> kind of. This, he has this kind of brittle uh, deference uh, thing going on. But uh, yeah, I'm, I don't. I'm not. I don't deplore the present. That would be incredibly intellectually lazy. But anybody can now publish anything, and that mm. includes real dickheads. <laughs> thank you. Hi, Robert. Uh, Hello. Th thank you. Um, thank you so much for coming to Australia and giving us an opportunity to hear you speak. Thank you for having me. Um, I was just wondering, um, as a Peep Show fan, um, I was really fascinated to see Jeremy's um, fluid sexuality sort of get an expression towards the end of the series, and I was yes. wondering if that was something where you'd been thinking about it, or if um, it had been something that had been in discussion? Not really, thank you. No, it was, um, Peep Show, of course, is written by Sam Bain and Jesse Armstrong. Uh, they knew that about me, um, and it's not, and also, it's not as if this came out of nowhere. I think in series four or five, Jez has a conversation with Sophie, and Sophie's worrying about getting married to Mark, and she says, uh, I've only slept with four people, do you think that's enough? And Jeremy goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you hear Jeremy go, Jesus, I've slept with more than four guys and I'm basically straight. <laughs> um, and so... <laughs> so... Uh, so it, it was kind of... It was more consistent with the character than... I, I think it probably... It took some Peep fans by surprise, but it, it has been planted there a while ago. No, it wasn't so much to do with my own... Uh, teenage shenanigans. It was more to do with them. Um, they thought it would be funny to put Jeremy in this really uncomfortable bisexual love triangle, <laughs> which, uh, having experienced a couple of uncomfortable <laughs> bisexual love triangles, is horrible. <laughs> Thank you. Um, 
Again, down here. Uh, hi, Robert and Clementine. Hello. Uh, hi. hi. Um, I was just wondering uh, the process of writing this book, whether it had affected your approach to comedy in any way and, you know, what's sort of deemed to be funny or not funny, um, yeah, through, through your experience. Uh, thanks. In terms of um, how I approach the material in the book, it, it kind of took care of itself, really, because the default is to try and be entertaining, to tell these stories in a, in a, in a funny way. I, I like making people laugh still. But obviously, when you get to stuff like my mum dying, that's, of course, where you, you feel a sort of duty of care for the reader, really. I've had 28 years to get used to this idea. I don't want to drop this bombshell on the reader. Uh, so you, you feel, I feel sort of protective of them and I don't want to throw it away with, with some jokes because obviously there's a sense of decorum about this and, and also respect for her and respect for the fact that it wasn't, she's not just my mum, she's other people's mum's mum as well. So, so of course, the, you, know, you find the tone for, uh, for whatever story you're telling and there are sort of lyrical moments and there are sad moments and there are funny moments and there are some very deeply embarrassing moments and you know so it kind of it kind of the form is content i mean the, the, what i'm saying kind of dictates how i say it if that makes any sense it is a hysterically funny book as well but but there are moments of real sadness in it too and yeah that that ability that way that he, he weaves the light and shade in there makes it a, a much more amazing book than if it were just strict comedy um, hi, Robert. Just um, Hello. considering all we've talked about, did you ever um, grapple with playing a character like Jeremy who wasn't nice? No. No, it's, <laughs> it's a lot of fun to play someone who's not nice. I mean, in the, I, mean I, I tried to make him lovable enough that you don't mind spending half an hour with him. I mean, because on the, on the page, he's a real shit. Um, <laughs> you know, he does some really bad things. And, you know, he's petulant and pathologically greedy and selfish and delusional and I mean it was a real stretch to play him <laughs> um, but uh, no he's because he's because he's funny so you know I was you know wanting to be funny so yeah, I didn't and also if you if you mean morally I think Peep Show is an entirely moral show I'd be once my girls are old enough that you know to deal with some of the adult themes uh, <laughs> I'd be very happy for them to watch it because the it, the the, the the heart of the show is always in the right place, even though you've got Mark and Jeremy. They know they're about to do something awful. They know they shouldn't do something awful. They do something awful anyway. They feel bad that they've done something awful, and then they do something awful. And, you know, the, the, but the, the, the authorial voice, if you like, the voice of the show, is it's very clear that these, are, that these guys shouldn't be doing what they're doing. So I, so I think, it's a, I think it's a very moral show. <laughs> I think it's a good sign of how deeply the trick fucks up women, that a lot of women I know are very attracted to Jeremy, the character. Yeah. <laughs> I can't um, speak to that. Just wanted to very... I don't think we've got any, anyone else lined up, and I just wanted to quickly finish on the note. You quote RuPaul at the start of one of your chapters, and I'm not sure if you're a Drag Race viewer or not. Uh, are you? No. You, no. No, I, well, just, I just came across that quote somewhere. At the end of... At, usually towards the end of the season when there's about four people left, he has them sit down and he shows them a photograph of themselves as little boys, and he says, what would you say to that photograph now? Oh. So what would you, if you could see little Mark, uh, little Mark, sorry. <laughs> I was thinking of Mark and Please, Jess. Please, at least little Jeremy. <laughs> if we're gonna... <laughs> I just had that image of Mark's face in the other quote that you have of, from Peep Show where Jeremy's saying to Mark, so you're gonna marry her out of embarrassment. <laughs> and yeah. Mark responds, there are worse reasons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you had little Robert, Robert in yes. front of you, uh, what would you say? I'd say I, I really wouldn't tell him to... Uh, if, he's, if he's little, he's a child, I, you know, I'd say just do your best, carry on, try not to uh, cause too much harm when you're bigger, but as you are now, just you're fine, and don't worry, and everything's going to be fine. Uh, that's, I mean, that's what you say to small children. Uh, We're to lying my, to, to them. To my teenage self, I'd have some stern words. <laughs>
thank you all so much for coming out tonight. Um, thank you in advance for buying the books and having Robert sign them for you. Um, please join me in giving a big round of applause and thanks to Robert Webb. Thank you. Visit wheelercentre.com for the best in books, writing and ideas from Melbourne, Australia and the world. <laughs>